Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Reprogramming the Immune System to Halt Myasthenia Gravis, an introduction to the core nanoparticle technology and trial in MG. I'm Jenna Mbalo, and I'll be helping moderate today's session. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that you could put your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we can answer them during the Q&A segment. I'd like to take a minute to also thank our sponsors, uh, Lexion Argenics, Amgen, UCB, Johnson & Johnson. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Peloso. He's the Chief Medical Officer at CORE. Welcome, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Janet. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate everyone's uh, time today. Uh, I, I, I want to go through a few things with you first. I want to tell you a little bit about our company and who we are. Then I want to tell you about our technology, the CUR uh, nanotechnology platform. And then I'm going to spend the remainder of the presentation talking about why we're excited to test the CUR nanotechnology platform in myasthenia gravis. And I will say, when I was preparing for this talk, I, I spent a lot of time at the MGFA website, and I would strongly encourage you to do the same. There's some wonderful information there. Uh, much of it is uh, even more well done than, than we put things together here. Um, we're often asked, where does CUR come from? It's an abbreviation of the word courage. So if you say courage or courage, however you say it, it's just the uh, front part. And um, we are um, a small biotech that has a mission of changing the course of autoimmune diseases with potentially curative therapies. And I'm going to tell you about our technology, uh, but we've already shown in animals and in patients that we can modify the natural history of autoimmune diseases. And we're very excited to try it in myasthenia gravis. Um, this is the team uh, and uh, we are a, a company that's been around for 10 years. A lot of our team is new, all very experienced people. Uh, Danielle Applehans, who's our chief executive officer has been working in the pharma space for 30 years a very accomplished individual um, and the people you see uh, on the screen. And I'm gonna reference a lot of the groundbreaking science that uh, Adam Elhafi on the far right and his team have performed uh, over the last 10 years. To briefly introduce myself, I, I joined in uh, July of 2024. I trained in medicine, in rheumatology and epide epidemiology, and I was in academic practice for 15 years in the clinic, on the wards, in the emergency rooms, uh, seeing patients with a variety of illnesses. And I made the decision to transition into pharma, um, thinking that I could help a whole lot more patients by bringing new drugs uh, to the marketplace. I've worked at a number of places, including some of the institutions that have sponsored these forums, uh, big, big companies, including Amgen and Merck or MSD, as it's known outside the United States, AbbVie, and some smaller companies, in, including Horizon Therapeutics uh, and uh, uh, Acceleron. And as I mentioned, I've, I've just joined, I've had their really distinct pleasure in my career of bringing a number of products to successful registration around the globe. And I'm excited to talk about the potential of the core nano technology platform here as well. Um, here you see our pipeline and we're active in myasthenia gravis. Uh, you're not surprised by that. We're also uh, looking at another rare disease, uh, type one diabetes. Um, and this is, um, often occurring in kids, and it's also driven by uh, abnormal um, proteins. Uh, and we're looking at other indications, uh, particularly in the rare orphan space. 
Uh, I'm going to show you a bit of the data uh, in our partnered programs around uh, celiac disease, which in fact gives us confidence that the technology works. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the nanoparticle particle technology. Essentially what we have is uh, a polymer coating with uh, proteins or other antigens on the inside. And what's really important about this whole uh, molecule is the size at 500 microns and the charge being negative overall are key ways that it's recognized by the immune system. So normally in everyday life, cells get broken down and that waste needs to be managed. And the body also has to recognize that it's, this is me, this is not something foreign. And part of the way the body does that is related to size and related to the negative charge. So what happens is these particles are taken up by the liver and spleen and the polymer coating dissolves. And what the immune cells in the liver and spleen see are the proteins that are left over that we can design and put in the particle. And that's really important because in the case of myasthenia gravis, the body makes antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. Um, therefore, it recognizes the acetylcholine receptor as abnormal or not self. By putting proteins that are part of the acetylcholine receptor in the particle and having the particles go to the liver and spleen and then be presented in the way the body normally sees things that it determines our self, the immune system starts to recognize the, um, the uh, acetylcholine receptor as itself, and it starts to turn off the immune response that leads to the antibody production. Now, the interesting thing about the technology is we can put in a single protein or we can put in multiple proteins. Um, and uh, for some diseases like um, type 1 diabetes, for instance, we know there are four major proteins that are contributing to the immune system being overactive. And for that program, we've put in four different proteins to retrain the immune system. So it's key that its size and its charge deliver these proteins to the right spot of the immune system so the immune system can relearn that this is normal, healthy protein. So I said I was going to show you that we've already demonstrated this uh, technology works. And in this particular study, we looked at celiac disease. And I'm sure all of you have seen gluten-free foods in the grocery store. Uh, folks with celiac disease have a real allergy to gluten. And what happens is when they take gluten in, they get bloating and diarrhea, but they actually have an immune reaction in their gut. And the normal lining of the gut, which is um, very up and down, having these finger-like projections that can remove nutrients from the uh, material passing through the bowel gets destroyed. So we don't have these finger-like projections that are um, all the way out, uh, along the gut. Uh, in fact, they get destroyed and the gut looks very flat. Um, and so we can measure that. And uh, in this particular study, uh, you see at the bottom the diagram of what the study looked like. We had uh, patients who came in for some uh, screening evaluations, and those little uh, blue uh, bags there represent the infusions, uh, a week apart, two infusions. Uh, and then what we did after we treated them is we put them on gluten and uh, looked at what the reaction would be. And we biopsied people at the beginning of the study with something called uh, endoscopy, where you put a tube down the throat um, into the uh, duodenum, very common medical procedure. Uh, and then we biopsied them at the end of this 14-day 
gluten challenge. And along the way, we measured a bunch of immune cells uh, in addition to the pathology. And this slide shows the results, and it looks complicated, but I'm going to take you through it. In the orange and red is placebo. In the blue is active therapy. Um, on the far left, you see uh, placebo T cells at baseline, the cells that produce interferon gamma, which are our sign of inflammation. And you see the, balls, the bar is very small on the left. And right beside it, after we fed them um, food with gluten for two weeks, you see how those T cells have really jumped up. But you do not see the same thing in blue. Um, in the two blue bars immediately next to the orange bars on the left. On the far right, what you're now seeing is the results of the biopsy at the beginning. That's the first uh, bar. And then after uh, a two-week uh, diet high in gluten, and you see how the height of those villi or fingers in the bowel have dropped versus the blue where they're basically the same, not much different. So that showed that not only did we induce an inflammatory response with the gluten as shown on the far left, but on the far right, it also led to the typical changes we see um, in patients with celiac disease. And we've had um, experts look at this, and what they told us, if they looked at the biopsy in blue on the right, they would never have diagnosed celiac disease based on the, the, the way the tissue looked. And in the middle, suffice to say, we looked at two types of cells that go into the gut to cause trouble. And um, they have uh, specific names. CD4 positive, CD38 positive cells um, in the left of the middle figures, uh, CD8 positive, CD38 positive cells in the right of the figure. Think of this like NASCAR where the cars are all decked out with different logos of who's sponsoring them. That's all that really means. It identifies the types of cells. But basically what you see in both panels is in the um, orange and red, there's a real increase in these bad actor cells uh, on placebo with really no increase on uh, those treated with the current nanoparticles. So we know that the technology works um, in a disease that's particularly prone to uh, inflammation if you see the wrong antigen is the word we call. Um, briefly, uh, around myasthenia gravis, it's a rare disorder, and I call it a rare disorder uh, not because of how uh, horrible it can be for affected individuals, but the FDA has defined rare as affecting less than 200,000 people in the United States. And I think we say 65,000. Uh, the website says around 70,000. Um, one of the uh, issues with rare diseases they, is they just get less attention overall. And so, yeah, they're both uh, approximately correct. We know that current therapies do help to control the inflammation. That's part of myasthenia. Um, and it's wonderful that as we're showing on the far right, there's a lot more investment in the space because it is a horrible illness. And we certainly do need additional therapies. Um, the mainstay has been uh, corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation, and then something added on top to reduce the burden of uh, steroids because they themselves cause real issues. And so we've seen uh, the anti-FCRN therapies, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We've seen the anti-complement therapies. And there are some other exciting things on the horizon with CAR T cell therapies. Um, all of these uh, don't fundamentally retrain the immune system. 
uh, but they do go a good way towards dampening down the immune system. You have probably seen some version of this cartoon elsewhere, but on the top, in the far left, in the yellow, is a nerve ending. And what you see are those blue dots that represent acetylcholine. Um, acetylcholine is released as the result of a nerve impulse, travels across this space, and you see these pepper-like red uh, images on the other side of that gap, those are the acetylcholine receptors. That's what is affected by the antibodies. That's what gets destroyed. And um, historically, what we've been able to do with physostigmine and related compounds um, is because the number of receptors has decreased, uh, we just stop acetylcholine being broken down so it can stay uh, around longer and hopefully find a receptor to signal through. Um, and the majority of patients with myasthenia will have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, but of course we know not everyone does, and of, of course we know there are other antibodies as well. This uh, picture of, of this uh, young, lovely young lady represents uh, the disease very well. So it typically starts in the eyes and then moves to what we call as physicians the bulbar area, the head and neck, and then moves into the arms and legs. And what you see here, she's trying to raise her eyebrows up, and you can see the difference between right and left. She's trying to open her eyes and you can see there's a difference in the ability she has to open her eyes fully. And she's also trying to do a closed mouth smile. And you see the difference uh, in her face, um, all very typical features of myasthenia. Um, and uh, um, we have a variety of medical words for all of these effects. Uh, ptosis or droopy eyelid, diplopia or double vision because the muscles of the eye uh, don't work in a coordinated way, uh, involvement of the uh, head and neck with dysarthria or difficulty speaking and dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. And we know, as I said, it may progress to the arms and legs. In severe cases, it can affect the breathing as well. And um, affected patients may well have to have uh, support for their breathing on a ventilator. There's a, a variety of drugs that have been used and uh, the anticholinesterases work by stopping the breakdown of acetylcholine. So just allowing it to be around longer so it can find a receptor to signal through and there's a variety of such. And those form the basis of the treatment for virtually all patients with myasthenia. Many drugs have been used to dampen the immune system. These include corticosteroids or steroids. You might know it as prednisone or prednisolone. And they interfere with a lot of aspects of the immune system. They're very powerful. They also have a lot of adverse effects, many, many, infection risk, um, thinning of the skin, thin bones, uh, uh, many, many uh, problems. And so we try to limit the dose of, of those as much as possible. And we do this in part through something called antimetabolites that essentially block uh, DNA synthesis. So the T cells, the abnormal cells, can't really replicate and divide. Uh, we, historically, we've used transplant therapies that block the messaging between cells and uh, therefore limit their growth, and, and tacrolimus is an example of that. Uh, we have therapies that remove all the B cells, and this includes uh, rituximab, um, which you know, removes all of them, including the bad-acting B cells that produce antibodies that lead to um, uh, effects against the, um, the acetylcholine receptor, and more recently, uh, the FCRN inhibitors uh, have come on the market, and those remove antibodies uh, from the system. So they remove all of them, 
uh, both the bad ones, but also the good ones. And that's really at the core of some of the problems with these therapies. We need those antibodies. We use them to reduce infection risk. And so these therapies can lead to increased infection risk and, and require very careful monitoring. Uh, complement inhibitors are very interesting because they're proteins that assemble that um, allow other cells to be destroyed. And they, we can interfere with this destruction pathway by using these complement inhibitors. But again, we need complement to protect ourselves uh, from some serious infections. And so these agents are only available under special uh, plans called REMS, or Risk Evaluation mitigate and Mitigation Strategies through the FDA. Um, so the good news, a lot of new things coming. Uh, important that we're getting new research in, in myasthenia gravis. The bad news, we still haven't gotten to a point where we have something that's safe and really modifying the immune system to get it more like normal. And I've included a bit of data here from Gvivgart, and you see in red the placebo group, uh, and in blue you see um, treatment with Vivgart. And uh, in, in the top left, we're looking at changes in activities of daily living in a standard questionnaire. Uh, we're looking at uh, quantitative scores. This includes um, some physician and patient elements. Um, and you see, uh, in the bottom, we're, we're looking at uh, a composite score again, very similar to a lot of the things that are done in the physician's office where they measure strength and other things. And on the bottom right, we're looking at uh, quality of life as measured by an instrument that is specific for myasthenia gravis. And in all of these, you see the difference between placebo in red and the active therapy in blue. And uh, that gap represents real meaningful clinical improvement. You also see in the graph, as denoted by the red arrow, that it doesn't last, unfortunately. And so um, ongoing treatments will be required, although exactly um, how often is still open to debate as far as the FDA is concerned. So we know we have some good therapies that definitely help with the flares and an overall control of the disease. Um, what we really would like is something that retrains the immune system. We've already looked at core nanoparticles in a mouse model of myasthenia gravis. It's a standardized mouse model. Most new drugs get tested in that first before it progresses to humans. And uh, I'm going to walk you through the figure in the middle of the page. Um, on the left, we have uh, what is labeled as naive. So these are healthy mice. And we're looking at grip strength. Um, the next collection of dots over, you can think of it as placebo. So these are diseased mice that have been in, um, treated, so they develop myasthenia, and now they're just treated essentially with placebo, in this case, just saline. And you see the grip strength is different than the normal mice on the left. On the two right parts of the figure, you see two doses of the Cura nanoparticle. And I, it, it is cheating a little bit, but I have a red line here that shows you approximately what normal is. And you see uh, with the saline or placebo, the grip strength is well below normal. With the two doses of the Cura nanoparticle 106, you see how grip strength is improved uh, with the 0 0.5 dose and even better with the 1.25 milligram dose uh, approaching normal. And so, uh, not only grip strength, we've, we've also shown that clinical score, as I show on the bottom there, is improved uh, with the Cura nanoparticle in a, in a way very similar to the grip strength graph I just showed you. So we know the technology works in celiac disease. We've shown the technology works in mice. So the next step 
is um, really understanding if it works in humans. So we've, we've designed an early phase study in myasthenia gravis uh, called CNP-106 that uh, encapsulates or uh, is contained in that particle that I showed you earlier um, with the uh, acetylcholine receptor, proteins of the acetylcholine receptor. And the goal is to get this particle to the liver and spleen and retrain the immune system that the acetylcholine receptor is normal. Um, we're going to look at uh, the changes in antibody producing B cells, and we're going to look at, as I show in the middle, in the center of the slide, um, some additional things like uh, activities of daily living and quality of life. And I'll show you what those questionnaires uh, look like in a few slides. As always, we've worked with the MGFA to get their feedback, and we've worked with experts in the field to um, ensure we have a design that's going to test what we uh, believe it should test and is um, going to be uh, reasonable and safe for patients to participate in. So here's the design. Uh, it will include men and non-pregnant women from 18 to 75. Uh, we'll start in the first cohort with patients with moderate involvement of the eyes, head, neck, arms, and legs. Um, assuming it's safe, which we predict it will be based on having used this platform in more than 70 patients in other conditions, will expand to class two as well, which is a milder involvement. And you see we're looking at um, a 150 milligram dose and a 350 milligram dose. And you see uh, in the middle for cohort three, uh, we're working with a data monitoring committee made up of expert uh, myasthenia gravis physicians. Um, and again, the MGFA worked with us to help identify those individuals. They'll help us make decisions on what dose we should test in cohort three. Maybe it will be a higher dose. Maybe it will be a dose intermediate between the two. Maybe it will be more patients treated with one of the doses that's all already shown. Um, but they'll help us make that decision. And on the basis of um, the first 18 patients, we will uh, do a longer uh, and larger evaluation uh, in the expansion cohort. I'm going to show you um, in the next couple of slides some of the things we'll be looking at. So I, I've already said um, men and women 18 to 75 years old who are positive for the acetylcholine receptor antibody. In this particular study, we'll look at those who are positive. Um, I've talked a little bit about the, the uh, classification criteria we'll use starting with three and four and then moving to two um, after we've established in the first cohort that patients are tolerating the therapy well. Um, they will require stable medications, corticosteroids and, and uh, per peridostigmine um, for at least 90 days prior. That's a study feature. We want to ensure that the therapy is doing something so we hold everything else constant. That doesn't mean if there's an issue during the study that your study doctor can't adjust. Of course they will, and, and we would encourage that. Um, there are uh, some key exclusion criteria. We're not going to look at folks uh, with just eyes only in this particular study, eye, involvement of eyes only. Uh, we're not going to look at the more unfortunate severe patients on ventilators in this particular study. Um, we will be looking at... Um, uh, other medications that people may well have used, and essentially, because the only thing we want to change is whether people get active therapy or placebo, uh, we're going to ask that other things be unchanged. And so, um, if somebody's interested and their uh, physician is uncertain whether they might be able to participate based on past medications, happy to go through that with your physician to help make that determination. Um, 
I always get asked, well, what happens at a study visit? And so I'm, I'm just outlining that here. You will have some blood drawn. Um, you will be uh, evaluated by the study coordinator. So this will include just some questioning about how you're doing and whether you're having any positive or negative uh, effects. And we're going to capture those in a standardized way. You will be evaluated by the study physician, and this will include some assessments that you will have had in the clinic already, tests of muscle strength, tests of coordination, et cetera, in some standardized measures that um, are recognized by the FDA as important in myasthenia gravis and important for making decisions around uh, drug approvability. And, um, you as the study participant or patient will also complete some questionnaires that look at activities of daily living and quality of life. And I'm going to show you here uh, what we call the schedule of events. Um, the study coordinator will have one of these in front of them, and uh, it gives an overview of the things that will happen by visit. So you see um, there's a screening period to see whether the patient might qualify. There's dosing on day one and eight in, in the little blue, shown in the little blue bags there. Um, and then there's evaluation out to 60 days. Um, and a variety of uh, things are being assessed at these visits. So you see activities of daily living, quantitative assessment of myasthenia gravis, quality of life, We'll be asking about other healthcare visits you might have had. Um, we'll be uh, also looking at blood here, shown on the bottom, the various T cells, and we're trying to show that there's been a sh shift from the inflammatory aggressive T cells more toward the protective or homeostatic uh, T regulatory cells um, that um, are. are uh, required to maintain normal immune uh, homeostasis. So there'll be um, some evalu physical evaluations, some questionnaires, and some lab. And what we show on the far right here is uh, patients will be offered the opportunity to have an extended follow-up. And for some patients, depending on when they enter the study, uh, there will be a third dose. One of the things that's not completely clear yet with this technology is exactly how many doses will be required. So we'll be testing that as well. This just gives an example of uh, myasthenia gravis activities of daily living, and it's a standardized score. And I think if you look at the items that are being tested, talking, chewing, swallowing, et cetera, and the gradation scale, um, you get a sense of how this is all summarized to uh, determine what the impact of myasthenia on activities of daily living is. This is a, uh, an additional questionnaire that patients in the study would be completing, and it indicates how myasthenia gravis is affecting their quality of life. And I'll just give you a second to look at some of the things. I'm frustrated, I'm having trouble with my eyes, um, limits my ability to enjoy hobbies and fun activities. A lot of things will be highly familiar to patients with myasthenia gravis. And they're just measured and scored in a standardized way across studies, which allows us and also the FDA to really determine the effectiveness of therapy. And this is my final slide. Um, it shows that we will be uh, throughout the United States, and we're showing here that um, this is a very active process. We're working with sites. We've worked uh, with the MGFA to help identify sites. Uh, we will be, um, we're, we're actively getting sites open. We have some open now. Uh, we have some sites that are soon to open, sh shown in yellow. And uh, we have some sites that we hope to open and we're working through the whole process related to that. The, the key thing I wanna say here is we will be working with patients to uh, support travel to some sites. 
Um, and and uh, if you think you might qualify, we'd love to hear from you. You see on the right this QR code, um, which will give you more information about the trial and, and um, uh, also about the uh, core nanoparticle te technology. You're also very welcome to email us any questions or comments at clinicaltrials at curvepharma.com as well, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I hope I wasn't um, too highbrow on all of this, but I really will look forward to um, hearing from you more about uh, your thoughts about the trial and uh, your thoughts about the technology. And I want to thank you all again uh, for your time. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we'll go into the Q&A now. We do have a couple of questions that have started coming in. Um, so the first one is, how long does it take for your immune system to reprogram once the last infusion is given? It, it's really an excellent question. And so we see changes. Um, it, it, I'm overly simplifying it. There are good T cells that uh, help maintain the body homeostasis. Those are T regulatory cells. And there are negative T cells that lead to inflammation. Um, and we see that shift occurring as early as two weeks. And certainly by six weeks, we're starting to see that shift happen. Um, and the open question is, how long will that effect last? And, and that's part of the reason we're looking at um, um, uh, doses beyond the first uh, day one and day eight. But we see the effects occurring as, as early as two weeks. Great. Thank you. Um, do you plan on opening a site in the Los Angeles area? Yes, absolutely. So on, on the map, we have uh, LA uh, noted as a site we're uh, actively trying to open. And not that you folks should worry about all of this, but you know there is a lot of paperwork that we have to do to um, assure the FDA that we have uh, capable and qualified investigators. And um, you know, that, just, that just takes time. It's... Um, so it's, it is a bit of a process. And, and the other thing we do as a sponsor is we visit sites and we we're, uh, to convince ourselves that they have the right training and they have the right equipment and they have the right support staff. And, and so that's a process. But absolutely, it's our intent to open in the LA area. Sure. Two or three sites I'm, I'm hearing um, from Venu, my colleague here. This next question is, how long do you anticipate until the treatment is on the market? Three years, five years, seven years? Yeah, so um, the, um, it, um, it, it can never be fast enough, right? It, it is a horrible illness. And, uh, you know, I, I can tell you I have uh, family members affected. So um, that's part of the reason I'm excited we're in this space. Um, um, and, the, you know, I, because it's a rare disease... The answer is it could be faster. Um, so um, typically the FDA for a disease that's not rare, like lipids, for instance, uh, cholesterol problems, they might want to see 3,000 patients treated in two studies. So those are big and they can take a long time. For rare diseases, they're far more flexible. Um, and the FDA is typically willing to make decisions on about 100 patients. However, I will tell you, my experience is, if you really have results that fundamentally change the course of the illness, that 100 patients at a year is something that can be negotiated with the FDA. So. Um, you know, the standard answer based on where we are would be seven years, but given that it's a rare disease, um, we, we have the potential to get done a whole lot more quickly uh, because the FDA is a lot more flexible bringing therapies to uh, patients with 
you know, horrible diseases that are not common. Thank you. Is the retraining permanent or are ongoing treatments needed? Uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, uh, a really excellent question, and the short answer is I don't know, and that's something we're going to have to look at. And so in this particular study, and in fact all the studies we've done, uh, we're continuing to follow patients out to two years uh, to measure those T-cells to see if that switch from inflammatory T-cells to regulatory T-cells is permanent and also to, to look at other effects. Um, it's early uh, for the technology. Um, and so uh, we don't know. If, if I was going to predict, what I would suggest um, is that um, we will want some boosters along the way to continue to ensure that the retraining um, has really uh, taken hold. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is, if the trial results look positive, will placebo participants have the opportunity to receive the drug in the next phase? Yes, placebo patients will have the possibility to switch over to active therapy, yes. So, it, yes. So, uh, uh, temporarily for um, scientific purposes, um, that will allow us, there will be placebo so we can judge the drug effects. But yes, they will be able to switch over. Great. Um, somebody has a question about if they've had a thymectomy, are they able to participate? Yes, that is uh, not an exclusion. Um, the only thing we would uh, want to uh, avoid is a, a very recent surgery uh, because there is a healing time. And uh, what we don't want is is for people to have trouble and then they can't continue in the study or for people to have, um, you know, just something related to the reparative process post thymectomy um, inadvertently uh, blamed on the drug. So as is typical in clinical trials, once people are uh, stable after the procedure, it's, it's not a problem to have them involved. Great. Um... What are some of the side effects and risks of the therapy, if known at all? Uh, so we've we've treated about uh, over seventy people, and uh, it is an intravenous infusion that lasts uh, about uh, four hours. Um, long term, we'll look at ways to reduce the duration of the infusion, and we'll look at ways of perhaps not giving it intravenously. But for right now, it's about a four hour infusion. Some people, like all infusions, may have a reaction that requires us to slow down or maybe stop for a bit uh, and then restart. But apart from that, um, you know, I, I use the expression, the things that patients are reporting are things that happen as part of life, you know, um, headaches, um, you know, nasal stuffiness, um, not different between those on placebo and those on active. Things happen as part of life. And so one of the reasons to have a placebo group is to see is there a difference in the reporting of these effects uh, on drug versus um, placebo? And the short answer is um, no, we don't really see much of anything else. Thank you. Um... Is it possible that this treatment would address fatigue? Fatigue is a major issue for a lot of us. You know, I, I should have added that in my slide. And I will say the uh, MGFA website does a, does a nice thing on fatigue. Um, the, um, yes. And a lot of chronic inflammatory conditions do cause fatigue. And uh, it's, it's one of those horrible, sometimes debilitating, debilitating symptoms uh, that frustrate uh, patients, that frustrate doctors because we can't do a lot about it. Um, but we know, um, or at least we believe, a lot of the fatigue is related to the chemicals that are released as part of the immune response. And if we can 
um, you know, turn off some of those chemical reactions, we have the potential to uh, really ad address the fatigue component. Great. Um, will I need to keep a diary or log of my symptoms and treatment? That's... Uh, the short version is yes. Um, the um, the uh, study coordinator will be asking you about these things. Uh, it's not an intensive diary, meaning it's not something you'll have to fill out uh, every day um, in a regular and ongoing way, but it will be helpful for your visits to have some accounting uh, of your symptoms over time. Thank you. Uh, what happens if I experience a serious side effect or need to withdraw from the trial? Um, thankfully, to date, we haven't really seen uh, serious side effects, but life happens. And, you know, part of the reason I say that if you need something different, uh, your study physician uh, is fully uh, supported by us in doing the right thing for you. Uh, even if that means withdrawing you or changing your therapy uh, in a way that makes it harder for us to interpret the results from a scientific point of view. The key thing is, you know, keeping um, patients well throughout the process. So uh, it happens, we, um, we try to uh, anticipate uh, some scenarios where it's more likely to happen and say, if you know the following things are true, please don't participate. And we have a list of all of those. Um, uh, but um, it, it's, it's, it's part of doing studies. Um, I, I will say um, it's not uncommon that um, patients may miss a visit and then come back for that. Uh, there's been a whole revolution in the statistics of analyzing clinical studies so we can deal with missing data as well. So we know this happens. Um, we try to avoid it if we know it's going to happen. But the bottom line is, you know, we, we want our physicians to do the right thing by patients. And if the right thing is to withdraw them, then that's the right thing to do. Thank you. How might this trial affect my daily life and current MG management? Well, one of the um, reasons I went through all the existing therapies is um, we know there are flares. We know that, you know, dose of corticosteroids may need to be adjusted from time to time. They need to be higher. Uh, we know that there may well need to be adjustments in azathioprine or other agents that are used. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't do two things. Um, so I'm thinking forward to the future. So we have a patient with flare who needs more corticosteroids and perhaps needs uh, an adjustment of their azathioprine or maybe they need a switch to something else or maybe they need something added. Those are all the right things to do during a flare. Uh, there's no reason we also couldn't start the retraining of the immune system at the same time. And so um, while in a study we want to only change one thing, that is the core nanoparticle or placebo, um, in the clinic, if we're thinking forward to the future, there's no reason we can't do a lot of these things together in parallel uh, to not only get things under control acutely, but to start the process of retraining the immune system. Thanks. Um, this next question is, my MG affects difficulty swallowing and speech, sorry, speech slurring. I have been on prednisone for seven years since diagnosis. Would I qualify for this study? Um, it sounds like it based on, you know, just that information. Yes, it, it definitely does sound like it. Um, as part of um, the evaluation, uh, we would look at other medical conditions that and, you know, I, I didn't go through it in detail, but we know uh, patients with myasthenia, uh, for some strange reason, are more likely to have other autoimmune conditions as well. 
Uh, we would go through past medical history, other medical conditions, um, other medicines, uh, but just based on what I know, that that sounds like a yes. Thank you. Uh, this next question is, what about patients older than the test cohort? Will they be eligible for treatment after testing the original cohort? Uh, right now, we're looking at uh, age 18 to age 75. Uh, it does not, I, the disease doesn't limit to those age ranges, uh, as everybody on the line here, I'm sure, is aware. Um, and in the near term, um, we would uh, almost certainly stick with that. Uh, longer term, uh, we may well look at those younger than 15. Um, the uh, typically, uh, once the therapy is approved, the FDA doesn't have upper age limits. Even though they may describe the study population, they typically don't have upper age limits. Uh, they um, just ask that the physician using the medication uh, take the age and other health conditions into account when recommending it. Is there any hope for involving the seronegative community? The, um, the, the way our technology works is to retrain the immune system to the particular protein or antigen is another word we use uh, that the body appears to be misinterpreting as foreign. And, you know, unfortunately at this time, without knowing um, what the other proteins uh, that are driving the so-called, um, they've got to have something driving the immune system. We just don't know what it is. And because we don't know what it is, we cannot retrain the immune system to it. So that is a necessary first step, identifying the protein or antigens that are triggering the immune system to misinterpret uh, normal healthy tissues as, as abnormal tissues. And, and so, um, unfortunately, this technology is not going to be helpful in, in those situations. This next question is, if someone receives the placebo and ends up getting sick, will they need to drop out of the study to start a different treatment? So the, the, the first rule is always, you know, the physician has to do what's, what's best for the patient. And we know flares happen. Um, we know that, you know, patients will need changes in their medication. Um, and, um, and that's part of uh, being in a study. And um, over time, the FDA has gotten more liberal in this regard, meaning, uh, consistently they've said to folks in industry, treat the patient in a way that they need to be treated for their condition, but if the patient is willing to come in for uh, follow-up evaluations, please continue to include them. So um, there's, we talk about a variety of different types of withdrawal. You can be withdrawn from the study, just no longer uh, continuing to participate. You can be withdrawn from therapy, but still in the study. Um, and you can be um, uh, having changes in your treatment and continuing to receive treatment. All of those things um, over the last uh, 15 years, there have been advances in statistics that allow us to deal with all of them. So. Um, if it's the right thing to do to withdraw, then, you know, we would um, take uh, your physician's recommendation there. If uh, the patient could continue uh, with modifications in their therapy, that would be okay, too. Thank you. Um, are there any existing commercially available methods to measure the undesirable T cells versus the desirable T cells? These are really, uh, that's a really interesting question. And um, the short answer is no. These are, these are research uh, techniques. 
Um, some of the um, MG specialists may have labs that can do this, but they, I, I suspect they wouldn't routinely offer it to patients. We are using what we call in the business a specialty lab that is uh, doing this uh, specifically for the study, and we've worked with them to be sure that the assay uh, is measuring what we want it to measure. Uh, at this time, uh, these aren't sort of universally available tests. Thank you. Um, if a patient found that this treatment was effective, would you expect the patient come off all other treatments, such as prednisone and mestinone? You know, that's really the, uh, the, the holy grail, right? That the immune system has been so completely retrained that it's not having any more uh, inflammatory responses and nothing else is needed. Um, you know, that, that really is the holy grail. Um, do I think it's possible? I do. Uh, if you ask me how likely it is, I, I couldn't hazard a guess at this point. Um, but certainly, you know, by the time we have the results of the study, we'll, we'll be able to make a whole lot better guess around that. Thank you. Um... If, what about if a patient receives plasma exchange? Are they still eligible? Uh, the um, yes, it just depends on when. So um, it's um, uh, we would we would have some. Typically, that's given as an acute therapy for uh, you know abrupt worsening of symptoms, uh, but it doesn't last forever. And so uh, if they've had it. Um, but it's uh, been a couple of months prior than that person would be eligible for the study, yes. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to um, just take a minute and answer one question that keeps popping up a lot, which is if this um, presentation will be recorded and available, and the answer is yes. Um, it will be posted on the NGFA webinars Web page as well as our YouTube channel. Um, and that normally goes up within, I'd say, three to four business days after the webinar happens. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, we're going to wrap things up now. So I wanted to thank Dr. Peloso for your time and the wonderful presentation you gave us today. Really my pleasure. And thank you for all the excellent questions. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you for the great questions. Um, please be on the lookout for the recording as well as for upcoming webinars from the MGFA. Oh, and I see that um, if you would like to reach out, we can share the clinical trials link really quickly as well. I wanna make sure that shows up for everyone here. Thank you, well, Jeff. Yep. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye for now.